religion, politics, race. These can be pretty touchy subjects, hard conversations to have, especially when they are between close friends. Joel Maldonado and I sat down on a Zoom video to discuss some old school topics within the funeral business that she is bringing to light and the changes that she believes need to happen within the industry. Check it out. So guys, we are here with Joelle. I've already introduced her to you, but welcome, my good, good friend. I love you so yes. much. I'm so glad we can have this conversation. Um, and I think we were kind of talking a little off camera about how more people need to have these conversations. And I mean, I don't see things as black and white or gender sides and, and stuff, but I mean, it is a fact. It is a fact. I'm white and you are black. And there are things that are different about us, including our hair and our color of our skin and things. And there are going to be a multitude of things that affect us differently. That's just the world. Um, just like men and women, unfortunately, that is a reality. Um, and so you kind of brought up this topic and tried to kind of called out the school because this was brought to your attention, uh, the dress code at Gupton College. Yeah, John A. Gupton. John not A. Gupton. Gupton. Yep, not Gupton Jones. There's two Gupton schools, so it gets a little confusing. So this is the one in Nashville, Tennessee. And it was brought to light that a student was applying and they looked at the dress code. If you go to their website, I'll have the links down in the description of the video. Their dress code is laid out very specifically for men and then for women. So the initial that you had shown was the male dress code. It's very similar to the female. And I think the certain points that we're looking at um, more so are the exact same in both. However, I'm going to also, after we kind of focus on that, talk about some of the bigger picture with some of it as well, because um, I think it's a bit archaic how it's written. So we're going to just dive in. Why don't you tell me, do you want to read some of it and kind of give some of your initial <laughs> to it and kind of what this initial student had told you? Sure. Now, it wasn't the student that sent the message. I just want to be clear. Oh, I thought she had sent it. Okay. And she didn't send it. The person that sent it would act, was actually Anita. As you okay. know, Anita, oh, yes. also known as the National Board Review Coach or the National Board Exam Coach, she, um, or the MBE Coach, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, she actually sent it to me because she and I have been having this conversation about racism in death care in particularly since yeah. 2020. Um, as you and many other people know, I also teach a course on the care for black and other hair, makeup, cosmetic needs, everything, because that isn't a standard part of mortuary right. science education, which is a whole nother conversation. Yes. <laughs> but um, basically, she, um, the young lady, we're not going to call her name, no. um, says, so I'm applying to John Gupton Mortuary School in Nashville, Tennessee. This is their dress code which I have no problem with, but their hair part is a little off because most women wear ponytails and most of us black women wear braids or dreadlocks. Mm -hmm. All hairstyles or most hairstyles can look professional in my opinion. And what the code says is that hair must be clean and neatly trimmed above the collar. <laughs> Dyed color must be of natural color Hair should be natural and professional in appearance. Ponytails, braids, cornrows, and dreadlocks are not permitted. Evidence of ears must be obvious. Sideburns, I'm assuming for men and for some women, um, are to be thin and trimmed at the mid-ear level. And, and so, that, oh, sorry, I was going to say, and that is the males, so the females is a little different. That one says hairs to be clean and neatly styled, dye colored hair must be natural. Hair should be professional and natural in appearance. Short hair lends well to preparation room hygiene and prompts first call response. Um, 
ponytails, braids, cornrows, dreadlocks are not permitted. Nails should be neatly trimmed and filed to finger end length. So it does not mention the ears and stuff. So that is a little different than the initial where it looked like the female was supposed to have her, ha you know, have short hair and everything. They just recommend it. it looks right. Like. <laughs> right. And the problem looking at that, what's problematic for me is that braids, locks, ponytails, and even in some cultures, longer hair represent aspects of spirituality, represent personal journeys, personal spiritual journeys, mm -hmm. represent our culture, and represent so many other things that contribute to who we are as people of color, not just Black people. And that wording tends to specifically target the hairstyles adorned by BIPOC individuals. It doesn't say anything about kippas or head wraps or other type of things that are done with hair. It particularly targets black and brown hairstyles. And to me, that is extremely problematic and reads as racist. Now, whether that was the intention in doing that or not, I don't know. But what myself and so many other students and so many other professionals that are responding to this message and to this post they're saying is that this discouraged me from even getting into the field. I've gone on job application or job interviews and submitted a wonderful application, presented myself professionally and was turned away. And the only thing that I've been being told is that I need to change my hair. And in 2022, Carrie, that's just unacceptable. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. And I kind of prefaced in my intro, I'm going to play a little devil's advocate, but I know questions that people respond with in, mm -hmm. on, on my previous. Now, all of those hairstyles could be on a white person. They could, they but could. traditionally and customarily are worn by black people. Right. I mean, it's saying that I can't go in with a ponytail. I can't go in with a braid, a French braid, which a lot of white women do as well. Um, so some people will say, well, you're just taking a leap that it's just talking about people that are not white. Mm -hmm. It could, it does cover white people. I mean, to me though, as a white woman thinking, so I can't wear a ponytail. I can't like wear a braid. You know, I have white friends that have dreadlocks and stuff. Obviously that's not as common. Mm -hmm. Um, that still to me is a, weird thing to put in there like what am I supposed to do wear an old school librarian bun on my head like that to me even from my vantage point is odd like it's very old school and even the male not being able to have a beard but you can have a mustache sure mustache are now back in trendy but two years ago no they were not and a nice clean beard is just as professional as a clean shaven face, in my opinion. Um, so it is, it's almost an archaic, and as you're saying, very pointed at one specific grouping or a large grouping of people. So if you are, if you were then going to school, what would be your options? It sounds like this isn't enforced as much there. It's just how the their verbiage and all this stuff. But what would be your options of hairstyles that you could wear that are none of those as a Black woman? What would be my options? Okay, my options would be to wear my hair similarly to how it is now, which is in its natural altered state, meaning that I had to take the time yesterday to moisturize my hair, brush my hair, twist my hair down in hopes that when I go outside in the wet rain, it doesn't just expand and poof up and look crazy. Yeah. And I've um, traveled with Joelle and the <laughs> process and learning the process of her doing her hair. I'm like, you literally do this every night. And she's like, every night. Yeah. And I'm like, every night. And I have to tell you, just talking about time, because of how much time I know this is interjecting here, but this morning, my daughter, the older one, she came in and she, I had up on the screen what you are talking about. I had the dress codes. It had things. She, and she read what the student had wrote and she said, mama. And I said, yeah, honey. And she said, 
like I could cry thinking about this. She has very limited exposure. You know, she has two black girls in her class and they have the most beautiful braids sometimes, you know, their hair is always different. She loves mm-hmm. how they always have different. She goes, mama, black girls have the most beautiful hair. So beautiful. How long does that take? <laughs> like I said, girl, hours and hours. And she's like, I don't think I could sit there that long to get my hair braided. I was like, I don't think I could either. Like, that's a lot of effort. And I just want to interject that because you don't just like do a little something and go, it takes you a long process. Yes. Um, and imagine if a student is not only going to school, but also working clinicals or possibly doing an apprenticeship and on call, you may not have time to take the time to do what we call a twist out or braid out yeah. band yeah. knots or ensure that you're able to carve out that time. Or if you have to show up at a removal in the middle of the night to take your hair down, try to get a little bit of sleep, wake back up and do your hair again. So, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous that we have to have this conversation, but I so appreciate you holding the space for the conversation. Um, you asked what my other options, yeah, sorry. Would you asked what my other options would be. It would be to chemically straighten my hair to cut down on that time. And people like myself who are very proud of our natural hair, my natural hair is a part of my spiritual journey that goes against what I'm working towards internally, which is a more holistic and spiritually connected lifestyle. Not only that, those chemicals have been proven to cause harm over long periods of time. Not saying that if a woman or a black woman or any woman decides to chemically treat her hair with color or relaxers, which you guys refer to as perms, that that's a bad thing. It's just not what's right for myself and other women who adorn natural, women and men who adorn natural hairstyles. The second option would to be to get some type of weave or hair extensions put into my hair in a multitude of different ways. Students might nece- not necessarily be able to afford that nor want to adorn those hairstyles. The third option, which is taken away by what that handbook states, is that I get my hair braided. I sit down for four, six, 10, 12 or more hours, pay a lot of money to get it done or do it myself, um, and then be able to just wake up and go in the morning. But that's not an option based upon what this dress code outlines. Not only are braids, locks, and those hairstyles a part of our culture, some people, their spiritual journey, they're also rites of passage to different things. So that language hits me a lot differently than it would hit someone reading, not knowing the significance of those styles. Yeah. Well, and I mean, they say that it's not enforced, but if it's not enforced, then maybe the language needs to change. And that's all I'm asking. And I want to be very clear about that um, because I've made other posts on social media, which have caused somewhat of a divisive conversation, in my opinion. That is never my intention. My my intention is always to educate and to inform. And in this case, to inspire others to speak up for themselves and remove that language because it, it, it reads very racist and discriminatory. Have from you, my perspective, have you looked into other schools and tried to like, just go to other schools and pull up dress codes at all? I've looked at one or two, but as you know, I've been in the midst of a move. I know and you're moving kind of took off a yeah. little bit faster than I thought it would. So I have not yet, but I do intend to, um, and I is not just, um, for schools. This is also for a lot of workplaces as well. Yes. And that's when you and I were texting about this yesterday and, and stuff, it really made me think, which was kind of one of my, not arguments, but kind of my things was, I always talk to students about workplace dress code, like, because you get people who we're all, we're in the era where the generations coming up are trying to define their unique individuality more yes. than ever, but yes. you hair color, tattoos, piercings, multitude of all of it, how they dress, everything, but they go to get jobs and do not get the jobs because they, they're not meeting the dress code or they're hired as they are. And then are told they have to change once hired, which that Mm -hmm. is wrong. But when they're going and they don't get it because they don't meet their dress code, 
they are like, well, they are, you know, biased against me and stuff, but if they have a dress code, it's for their business reason. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had this guy who went for an interview, a black man, he sent me a picture before, you know, him going to the interview, he's in a beautiful three-piece suit. Mm -hmm. Hair is tight, neatly braided a little longer in the back. Mm -hmm. He looked gorgeous. He did not get the job because their dress code is short hair. Mm. They said, and it was in all black firm, mm -hmm. fully black. So it's not, you know, one race to another trying to put it's, this is our dress code. And this was what you do. He ended up and he was really mad. He didn't get it. And he couldn't believe. And people were like, you look great. And this is racist. To me, I'm like, but it's a black firm just dictating to a, a person coming for a job who is black, how they want hairstyle. He ended up, did go end up cutting his hair and got the job there because he really wanted the experience of that specific firm. And he's like, you know, it's hair. It'll grow back when I want it to grow back. And I'm getting a good experience and everything. And, um, but it was a learning for, to talk to the other students about dress code mm -hmm. and things that it may not be what you agree with, but you have to adhere to what is there. Just like women have to wear skirts or mm -hmm. pantyhose or heels, which I think is BS in today's age that that is what it is because I don't wear skirts. I don't wear pantyhose. I don't wear heels. Like that's impractical for a lot of the work we do. Um, but it's, it brings up a lot of thoughts and conversations that students have had over the years, because I have a student Facebook group and watching their conversations and things that rile them up. And this is the first time this part of it has ever really become a conversation that I have seen in all the groups in terms of the schools. And I think it's important, especially now as the business is changing so much, and schools are in question, and the national board is in question, how these things are being addressed and looked at. Um, I'm looking at my questions. I had put down a couple of questions. Um, it also made me think about that story. Do you remember that little black girl that got her, that her teacher cut her hair? Do you remember that story? It was like last year or the year before, maybe it was before COVID and it was a few years and she came home from school and had her hair cut because the teacher just cut her hair. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm like, wow, that's, you know, just thinking of that much being imprinted on somebody and somebody else's perception of, especially like you say, your natural, what is part of just your heritage, who you are, all that you do. And I think my girl said that about the time, because when I came back from my trip with you and I told them how long it took you to do your hair, I was like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. What? I think you're you're making several good points as far as like we as professionals now are individualized in a way that we weren't before. Yeah. And that could either be through the influencer role or the YouTuber role or the it's not just the funeral home that's represented. It's Carrie, it's Joelle, it's Lauren, it's Anita, it's it's that individual, right? Right. And I think it's a very slippery slope. And I must admit, because where does the door shut once we open it? Okay, mm -hmm. these terms and these styles have significance on several levels. Mm -hmm. Does color have significance? Does cut have significance? Do piercings have significance? So I acknowledge that once the door is open, it's going to open 100%. However, I want to reiterate the naming of those particular styles mm -hmm. only Target one group, particularly not that white people don't wear locks, right. not that Hispanic people don't wear braids or Native Americans right. don't adorn braids. But if you look at the populations that attend mm -hmm. more schools, the people that are wearing these styles look like me. Mm -hmm. So what do you think if you had to write a dress code, specifically the hair portion for a mortuary school, for a business, 
how would you frame professional hair to be all inclusive? Like what would Joelle's answer to this be? That is a very good question. And I've been thinking a lot about this in writing this petition because it's like, again, once the door opens, it opens. Number one, hair should be clean, Mm -hmm. um, free of debris, free of odor. Hair should be reasonably dry because I've seen multiple white men and women show up at school, show up at work with (laughs) wet hair that is dripping wet. (laughs) getting other things wet, getting me wet when they <laughs> their heads. So it would be reasonably dry. But in the same breath, I understand that sometimes the quickest thing for me to do is to wet my hair and pull it back mm-hmm. just so that I can save 45 minutes in the morning or 20 minutes in the morning. Yeah. Um, hair should, I don't even want to limit it to color because I feel like hair color is such a form of expression However, you as the professional should have a professional appearance dependent on whom you're working with. There are people that come into the funeral home, as you know so well, Carrie, they have mohawks, they have green hair, they Mm -hmm. have afros as big as my head. Like there's so many different hairstyles that come into the funeral home. And I think representation and relatability is a asset that we're missing out on by limiting the hair. So that's my answer to that question. I hope that that answers the question. No, I think that's good. It's it's one of those things you have to have boundaries yes. of some kind because I think it's important to teach students there are boundaries in this world and you will have to adhere to boundaries just like with how they dress. You know, it's I'm surprised that some schools don't have a professional dress code. You go to some and the students have to be in a suit every day or a professional attire every day. You go to others and they're wearing sweatpants and, you know, messy buns or, you know, whatever with their hair and, you know, all of it. It's they rolled out of bed and went to school like a nor you know, most college kids do. Whereas it's not just a normal college. You're in a professional degree school teaching them how to dress and things and put themselves together is I think part of the learning and it's kind of over the whole time they're there but what those parameters would be that would be acceptable is is hard because you're always there's always going to be caveats yes he's going to have you know you can say dreadlocks but then sometimes that's you know t- I don't know, not too much, but I've seen people with dreads that are, they're dirty in there. And so I think that covers some of those maintained, but does maintained really enforce, you know, all of it. I think, but you can't really brush through braids and, you know, so that doesn't apply to that either. So it's thinking what can be universal terms for hair. Right. And I think a bigger part of the conversation that we're missing out on is that someone's capacity for professionalism is being limited to the way that they wear their hair. Mm -hmm. Now, should I show up in a wig cap (laughs) with no wig on? Absolutely not. Should I show up, you know, without my hair have been being groomed for days on end? Absolutely not. But then in the line of work that we do, that is also somewhat discriminatory because as we know, especially during the holiday times, many professionals deal with um, burnout, we deal with fatigue, we deal with some level of depression. Yeah. And a lot of times that is the first thing to go is the way that you care for yourself. But if you're showing up 100% with your heart out trying to serve families, does that require you being laid off or is that a conversation where you're offered support so I mean it's all encompassing if you really think about it but I just don't believe that how professional someone is is limited to braids or locks and let me touch on that for a second Um, there are some people I'm not necessarily one of the people that subscribes to this but prefer for their hair not to be called dreadlocks They prefer Mm -hmm. for their hair just to be called locks. 
because the term dread means scary or frightening. And historically, that is what individuals with locks were looked at as being terrors, dreadful. So the term dreadlocks was coined. Some people just prefer for their hair to be called locks. That's interesting. That is, I like it. That's, I think there's a lot of, edu- it's, it, it's all comes down to education. Some of yes. this, you know, who, yeah. who wrote this, who put this term together and how long ago did this get put together? I was looking at kind of the history of the school and, mm-hmm. and things. And, you know, I hate to pick on this school specifically, and I'm not trying to, but it's, I have a lot of questions and wondering, you know, are they, are they open to reforming? Why, why is it that way? Just nobody's looked at it. Um, or it, it just, they really believe those things. I don't know. There's, there are so many questions I have and it's interest. It, the whole thing is interesting to me, but like you said, hair is one part of it. I, you know, there's the whole dress code places talk about how many earrings you may have one set of earrings not two, you may have no tattoos. Sorry, people, you know, mm-hmm. and it's funny because now that I have this tattoo and I, t- I talk a lot with my hands and videos and people will comment. I've got a couple people who have commented multiple times, you know, Carrie, that's really unprofessional of you to have a tattoo. And I say, well, it's good because my suit coat covers it. So nobody will have to see it. And that's the great part about it. Sure. If it was on my neck or if it was on my hand, Maybe we, you know, it might be a different conversation, but if it's something that, or people do notice the start of, I don't know what this will turn into for my daughters. And it's like, is this offensive? If this is offensive to someone, I'm, I'm sorry, they're offended. My, my goal is not to offend somebody with my, my tattoos or my clothing or, you know, hair, but we do our best to be professionals. And I think, but I think how you are in all the aspects, like you're saying, defines you as a professional, not just the hair or the jewelry or the clothing. It's the the big picture Mm -hmm. and who you are. Um, Yeah. And not only that, um, it also communicates, um, which I said in the video that kind of started this whole thing, is that it communicates to those that we're serving that your loved one who has these hairstyles, they're not permitted. Yeah. You know, representation doesn't matter. There are people who come into the funeral home who immediately leave and go get a piece of art, a tattoo, representing their loved one. Mm-hmm. They would love to walk into the funeral home and see your art, yeah. expressing your love for your kids or you know your love or just anything. And I think that Even thinking about online classes, I have to put on a three-peat suit to show up for an online class. I have to spend 45 minutes in the morning, you know, instead of just getting some braids to show up for an online class, which the majority of institutions have implemented the onset of COVID. It's just, it's a conversation that needs to be had and the goal is never to attack. Mm -hmm. However, when something... (laughs) seems targeted specifically to me or people that look like me it's hard not to say okay why is this why yeah what are you not only communicating to students but the communities that you're training these students to go out and serve well in our it's yeah society is not what it was five years ago even it's just changed and it's saying hey it's time for somebody on your staff to update this Yes. Maybe you're not intending this, but maybe this has been overlooked over the years as it moves forward, but maybe you should look at it and just see, because maybe that was never the initial intention. And maybe that was written back in the 19, whatever, when, even though it wasn't not saying that it's ever okay to point that out, but Maybe that was more, I don't know, was it wilder back then to have locks and to have braids? Or is that something that has changed over time? You know, I don't know that. 
it's interesting because when Anita and I were talking about it, I I said to her, I said, it looks like they changed the first five pages of this and just copied what they had. I have not gone through the whole handbook, so I don't want to claim that I have, but it's like this, like you said, it's archaic. Even the wording, evidence of ears must be obvious. What if someone was born without ears? They, they're they not permitted at your school. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, well, and, and it I, sounds like they, your hair just needs to be short enough so that ears can be sh- like no long hair is essentially kind of what it's sounding like by those terms, I guess. But what a weird way to what a weird way what to a say. weird way to say it because I'm sorry, but the visual right now uh, that has come back from the 70s and 80s is longer hair, even for white people. The mullet's back, everybody, and the <laughs> Farrah Fawcett, I don't even know what to call it on men, the Farrah Fawcett, like, feathered hair on men, I, I like, is back for white men, and it's, so even, you know, white people it's it doesn't even it just I don't know it all I see I look at it from my perspective and kind of how I would read and I'm so you know gray I I see things gray and um that's my I guess my idealistic world that I would like to live in but I'm kind of just scrolling through the catalog because you were saying you haven't read through the whole handbook and uh all I really looked at was the dress code specifically, because that was its own drop down page of everything on there. And I'm trying to see if that dress code was in. Yeah, in the handbook, all it says is a professional dress code is required for all students online and on campus. The dress code can be found on the college website under student resources. That's all it says. So let me ask, I have a question for you if that's okay. Oh, of course. Um, you mentioned the national board. Yeah. You mentioned funeral service education changing drastically, which it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and now we're having conversations about hair and dress. I've been to some very unique funeral homes that have a completely modern Yes. You know, where funeral directors are not wearing suits, they're barefoot, they're in the earth. You know, Melissa is a great example of that. Yes. Um, what does the future of professionalism look like in the death care industry to you? Well, I think that right now is a big disruption um, because we're going through trying to redefine, I think, what death care really is Mm -hmm. right now because we have such a divide between the old and the new Mm -hmm. and not just age it's just the old way of doing things and the new generations and not just the young ones but the second career people and you know people coming into this profession that is very much in this medium limbo phase we all all these new dispositions coming up that are going to take forever to get legal everywhere because that's how our business rolls. We have families wanting to be served in different ways. You have the old school in the bigger cities. I would say, you know, you get to the city and it's a lot more traditional, but even so just to kind of give a glimpse right now in my area, if I go a half hour North and I attend a funeral directors meeting there, at least this was like 10, 15 years ago when I was going to meetings in different places, It was all white men, black suits, white shirt, tie. If I didn't know who they were, they didn't want to speak to me. It was very old school. Whereas if I go 30 minutes south of me, it is polo shirts, khakis, more casual. There is some of the suit wearing. There's a variety of mix between men and women much more casual. Maybe it's more country. Maybe it's more, I don't know. There's still a big city there, but it's wildly different. And students who are going into the business, depending where they live are encountering all of these different facets Mm -hmm. of the business. 
And we are like, what, 75% women or not more going into the business right now. So they are entering this very male dominated field, this very old school, old thinking, a lot of ways business. And there is a lot of walls that are up right now. And so I think we have to get through the next five, 10 years where they retire and get out of the business. <laughs> a lot of that wall making that is happening um, to allow something new to grow and be bred. And I think that until that happens, we're not going to really evolve and see the full potential of what the next phase is really going to be. But there's a lot of really bad stuff within our business. And I didn't even know about some of it because it's regional. It's racial. Honestly, I never had heard this until I went down South and spoke to a whole bunch of black students that a lot of black funeral homes they were encountering would not pay for apprenticeships. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying this is a full on thing. I have not heard that with, with white funeral homes. Of course they don't pay as, you know, nobody wants to pay much for anything. Um, but I never had heard the extreme. Mm -hmm. of not wanting to pay period. And I had so many, like dozens of black students I've heard from that have reported that. And I think that's an interesting, like why that, I don't know. I don't know why that dynamic, but to me, that was interesting. Um, and so you have that non-acceptance, that not being able to get in the business because you can't make a living. All these things where we have so many people excited about death care right now. So many people because of influencers, because of how forward and front in the world death care is right now being presented and is being accepted and all this variety of things that can be done. And people finally seeking answers to questions and seeking answers for their anxieties. Twice this week, I've done podcasts with individuals who are now 30, 40 years old, want answers to this anxiety that they have over death. And this is their answer to doing it because we now have these platforms. You can reach out to people in ways you can do it. But we have the old way of doing things like with the national board exam. There are states who are now putting in legislature and getting rid of the national board exam because the exam has changed and become this thing that is not working like it used to for whatever reason it's just not working and that's a whole different topic but if we do away with national board exams and we do away with maybe more choice schools one day maybe it becomes an apprentice only thing when you know hands-on only training after you do a set number of classes at any community you know like who knows what path this could go down. But when you have kids failing the national boards, can't get done with it, can't get licensed after they're doing all this schooling, that's a problem. I don't know. It's a very rambly answer, but I think we are really in this purgatory, not saying it in an like hell sort of way, but we are in this big limbo right now, waiting to see which way it's going to go because like you said, there's so many variety now of, and it's, it's very regional. People are like, so what's your experience with this? And what's your experience with that? And I'm like, I am in middle America here. We are super, you know, one or the other. We don't have composting. We don't even have aqua alkaline hydrolysis here. We don't have all these things yet. Whereas they're happening just not here. Right. And so there's this variety now of things you can do. It's just not everywhere. And I don't know, it's, I'm excited for what's in the future of how we're going to do death care, because I think it's going to get to be more hands-on again, and it's going to be more care for our loved one. It's going to be back to the take care of our generations that I love in all these cultures that I witness you know, where people come in and bathe their loved one and they're there with their loved one and they bury them and they're, or they cremate them and it's hands on and it's what you should be doing as a family rather than, can you pick up grandma? I'll pay you on mine and you can just go 
put her in her um, niche over at the cemetery. We're good. And that's it. Disposal, you know, which should we just drive around a wagon that you can throw your dead out in and we'll just pick them up and take care of them as if, I don't know, such a question. Theory Mm -hmm. off our topic, but (laughs) I think it is a great question that I have a lot of thoughts. They're just not all in the same pile right now, I guess. (laughs) I did want to say one more thing, and I don't know if this you can edit it or if it's going to be continued. It 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 just came to me um, when yeah. you were talking about covering up your tattoos. Um, covering up a tattoo, yeah, is so different from covering your hair. Oh God, yeah, it's so different. And imagine if you can, not just in death care, but through your entire life in every situation where you're interacting with others that don't share the same culture, belief, skin care, hair texture, whatever, you're being asked to change, to change. It's not right. It's not good enough. It doesn't look how I want it to. That is what students are confronted with when they read things like that in handbooks. Yeah. Like, do I go shave my head and take away my identity? When is it enough? When will it be enough? When you know, I can't cover up my hair. I'm not going to, you know what I mean? I mean, I could, but I'm not going to. And I don't think that it's fair to ask me or any student of any culture, any race, of any background to do that. Um, and so you asked what my dress code would look like. It would look like something that honors individuality while promoting professionalism in a non-exclusive way. Which is a broad answer, but it's that is a broad answer. stroke, isn't it? <laughs> it's absolutely nothing but everything with that answer. <laughs> That's right. It's it's big, but it's little all at the same time. You know, and this is totally different. But when you're talking about that and taking away identity, it takes me back to thinking of when I was in mortuary school. We took care of all the cadavers for five states worth of medical schools. Mm. And so all the bodies would come to us that were being donated and we would do the injections. Mm -hmm. We would do a first injection. The body has to sit for, I believe it was two days. We're talking, you know, this was 22 years ago. I was doing this, um, two days. And then you bring them back out and you do a second injection during that second injection. We had to shave their heads and we did that. And we're told we were doing it to take away their identity and to take away who they were as a person so that the medical students could see them as being not human as much anymore and would not feel as much feeling working on them. Hair is identity and it is human and it is what makes a person a person. And controlling that If we're going to shave a head to make a medical student feel comfortable, how would that person that's laying there, if they were alive, feel if we shaved their head or defined how they had to do that? And that's exactly what this is. And you saying that like, wham, that just all came back to me of, of having to do that because it was one of the hardest things shaving this person's head we then put Vaseline all over them, wrapped them in cheesecloth to just keep them from dehydrating. Um, It felt like Auschwitz. I'm not joking. Like it felt like this demoralizing moment, even though they were dead, they've donated their body. They want to be a cadaver. They want to go and help and they want to do what they're going to do. Still is hard. Um, So it's interesting that people can, can say those things. And I'm not saying, not comparing you know, Auschwitz and and Copton school at all. Um, But just kind of that, how much hair was important in just that moment and that we should take that away to take away identity and how much identity is defined by hair. And so trying to control that and someone is, is very, it's just wrong on any, no matter the race, no matter anything, that's just wrong. And I mean, if, Gup, uh, John A. Gupton, I want to make the distinction. Yeah. John A. Gupton, not Gupton Jones in Atlanta, which is my alma mater. <laughs> but um, John A. Gupton in Tennessee, you know, you want to learn more about that? I have 
myself and Anita have classes on racism and death care, disenfranchised grief. And I also offer a course on cultural competency as it relates to the hair, skin care, and cosmetic care of Black decedents. And I think, uh, yeah, and that's good. You know, we want to be a positive answer. We both mentor students. We both try to educate as much as we can to consumers, students, licensed individuals. And we're not just shouting that there's an issue. We're just saying that we love to th change things towards the better in some way, because that's what we like to do. And we're both professionals. We're both um, people who like to see a better version of death care. And we want students to want to do this yes, and feel good about doing it because going to a mortuary school, like when I went to Pittsburgh recently, how excited these students are. Like, it's so fun to see someone excited about going to mortuary school yes. and about learning this stuff and about wanting to know all of it and getting out there and trying to make a difference. And it sounds idealistic. I get it. You know, it's not always warm fuzzies and, you know, rainbows and roses, but going in with such a pure heart into it, wanting, we want that. Mm -hmm. We want them to feel good. We want to direct them towards things they can do to be more marketable in the broad sense. Mm -hmm. um, but putting such ugh, ugly things out there is very, it's roadblock, the roadblocks. We need to get rid of those roadblocks, those nasty, not inclusive roadblocks. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime. I saw your brain click when you were talking about shaving the hair. I saw your brain click. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's, it's one of those things. It's, it, things are going to perspective in different ways. And I have, when I think about though, that what we did, I always forever have one face that will never be gone from my memory when I was shaving her hair. And it was not my first, it was not my last. It was just one that for some reason, her face will forever be in my mind. I don't know why, but it just stuck with me. And thinking about, I think, cause it, it just, the feeling I had in that moment of what I was doing did not sit well with me. And I had done it several times. It wasn't, but just something just didn't sit well with me in that moment and that time. Just, you know, and so going back to that and especially something you said and it just clicked of that, how much of you that really is truly. So, yeah. yeah, we all have bad hair days. So imagine being told that on your good hair day that it's not good enough, you know, kind of thing. That's not okay. It's not okay. We can do better guys. We can do better. And thank you for having the conversation. And of course, <laughs> I, I'm so grateful that you held space for it. And that, yeah. I mean, that's what it is. Like, I don't think anybody's here to bite anybody's head off. I mean, that's not my intention. That's not even my personality, <laughs> but. No, and I say in the conclusion to this video too, like I reached out to the school. I asked if they wanted to comment because this is a discussion happening. There's a discussion on if this is archaic, if this is racially, you know, dominate, like if it was intended to single out and um, they did not want to comment, they did not want any part of, you know, putting in their two cents and which is sad because I had hoped maybe they would say, you know, here at John A. Gupton College, we don't want blah, 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 or we would love to discuss this and, you know, make some changes. And I, I don't know, that's my you know, rosy thinking that maybe that was going to be a response, but it wasn't. And, um, who knows if my approach was good or not. He just, he could, he couldn't understand who I was. He was like, now who are you? Mm -hmm. And I think he was caught up in that part more so than the other, but right. That's okay. That's okay.
would it be okay to mention the petition? Sure. Yeah. Tell, uh, tell us what you're up to with it. Sure. So um, actually just created it this morning on change.org. Uh, a petition, you can read more about it. I'll give you the link, but we want to have that verbiage that excludes those specific styles and any and all other natural or protective styles adorned by BIPOC individuals completely removed from handbooks for all institutions, um, if it exists. And let me stress again, it's my knowledge that it exists in a few. I can't say it exists in all. And also in workplaces, but we're focusing on the mortuary science education portion now because the education influences the practice. Agreed, agreed. Well, thank you for joining me, Joelle. And she's talked about a lot of her courses. As I said in the intro as well, she has different courses on all sorts of things for consumers, for students, for licensed professionals. And we want you to weigh in on this. Go read the, the dress code. The link is below. And give us your initial thoughts. You know, try and go in unbiased. What, what do you think? How would you rephrase things to be more inclusive, to allow for uniqueness, personality, but professionalism in a fully inclusive way? We don't know the best way, but maybe someone will put some content below in comments that will help us to maybe present something and that Joelle can present to colleges to the a board somewhere to somebody to help this become a better way of doing it there's got to be a better way joel there is there has to be even if we don't have the answers no it'll formulate though and that's why picking picking brains and getting input and sometimes off the cuff response by a random anybody reading something can be your best answer which i love so thank you guys and thanks for understanding we don't all have to have the same opinions to love each other and to have a conversation and to you know move forward and find a better everything so thank you guys a huge thanks to joelle for diving into this topic with me. I think it's an important conversation to have, whatever your opinion on this may be. I like to look at things from all sides. I don't like to lay over all my opinions on it, but I like to kind of take it apart in different ways and look at it in different ways. And I think we've done that today. The conversation went all sorts of directions and it was hard to predict how it would go. So I'm thankful that I have a friend that can give me such insight, can provide such candor with me over whatever topic we may put on the table. Now, I did reach out to John A. Gupton College about the dress code. I provided them the opportunity in a phone call with Steve, who I'm believing is the president. He did not present his last name when he got on the phone. Um, I talked to a receptionist. They passed me over to someone named Steve who was going to handle my call and they knew what my call was about. And I said, there is a lot of conversation right now on social media going on about the dress code at your school. And I wondered if you wanted to give me a comment. And he wasn't understanding who I was or um, what I was talking about. And so I gave him a little more information, explained more about who I was. And he said, no, I I will not come in on any of this. So they were provided the opportunity to give some input, to talk about, you know, changes that may be coming, but we got nothing. So I'm hoping that change can come in the future with all of this. We can update some dress codes. We can update parameters. We can make things more universal. I like to think positive thoughts. So um, and we'll be taking some positive actions. So thank you guys for joining us. Make sure to check out Joelle, who is the grave woman on all of her social media platforms. And if you feel strongly about this, after you've educated yourself on the topic, gone and looked at the dress code yourself, drop a letter, send an email, 
do something, take action, and move forward with us. Thank you guys. Bye. Thank you.